Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. We're so thankful for the opportunity to be here and to, to see all of you once again. And, uh, today we're going to be looking at 1 Peter, uh, as the scripture that was read earlier, 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you'd like, you can turn there. And as you're turning there, I'd like to take this opportunity to challenge us a little bit with regard to what we're going to look at here. So what tends to dominate your thinking today? We all have things that often take uh, control of our mind and just are constantly uh, milling through our minds. And maybe it's a difficult circumstance that we're facing, a hardship. Maybe it's a loved one that um, we are burdened for. There are a lot of things that can be, just be really on our mind and gripping our thinking. And um, in this epistle to uh, several churches in the Galatia region of Asia Minor is really written to a people who were struggling, who were suffering for a lot of reasons. They are dispersed. Um, in some cases, these are uh, Jewish background believers that have been dispersed into these other regions. So there they are um, a foreign people. And, and so they have to deal with that um, uh, reality in their lives of maybe not feeling accepted, maybe actually being rejected because of their, their different um, uh, beliefs than the other people that are around them. And then there are also those that turn to Christ from idolatry in those places, these Gentile believers, maybe that these cities where they are living are the places that they were born and raised, but they're, they still find themselves strangers because their lives have been changed. They've been transformed. They're no longer uh, given to idolatry. They're no longer uh, a part of this culture that does not know the Lord. And so they too are suffering. They too are um, perhaps ostracized from different aspects of society. Perhaps um, their place of, uh, of employment uh, is a hostile environment now because of their faith in Jesus Christ. We serve in a part of the world where this is a, a very common reality. And I think as time goes by here in the United States as well, we are no strangers to being ostracized as believers in the environments where we live and work. And this is a, a continuing uh, reality for many of us. Many of us can relate to what's going on here. But we can also think beyond um, the immediate um, context here of suffering because of being strangers in a place, but there are many reasons why we suffer, many reasons why we um, have a lot on our minds that, that tend to weigh us down. And so I want to challenge each one of us through the word of God to put our focus back on Christ and the abundant mercies of God. Because that, as I look through this passage, I see as a very important theme in a, an answer that is being given to a people that are struggling, a people that are suffering, to turn their attention back to what God has done, to who they have become in Christ through the uh, powerful working of God in their lives, through the work of Jesus Christ. And so we can understand that by the Apostle Peter taking an approach like this as a way to encourage and build up these believers in the Galatia region of Asia Minor or modern day Turkey, we can um, understand from this that at the very core, at the very heart of um, finding uh, strength to continue on in living, finding peace in the midst of turmoil, we must turn our gaze back to Christ. We must turn our focus back to what God has done through Jesus Christ in our lives. So what that means is that the reality of Christ in us and us in Christ is at the very heart of the solution 
for having abundant life no matter where we are, no matter what situation that we are in. And so uh, we must understand, first of all, that if this is what is going to uh, bring us out of the depths of despair and to, to uh, strengthen our hope and to strengthen our lives and to cause us to be willing to, uh, to move forward for the cause of Christ, then we need to take careful analysis of what this passage is, is saying to us because here we have a very important message that touches the very hearts of each one of us. Each one of us find ourselves in similar situations. We might not be strangers in the land that we're currently living in, in the, in the, um, in the city that we're currently uh, living in, but we are living in a fallen and a broken world. And there is a solution for every single one of us, no matter where we are. As followers of Jesus Christ, we do have hope. And this hope is tied directly to the abundant mercies of God. As, has, as we've seen as our theme today, we need to reflect on the abundant mercies of God. So today I want to challenge each one of us to let the abundant mercy of God dominate our thinking and direct our life choices. As I look at this passage, I really see those two areas of emphasis. One, to dominate our thinking, but two, to direct our life choices. Because if the abundant mercies of God only dominates our thinking, but doesn't direct our life choices, then we're holding back what God wants to accomplish in our lives. We're holding on to something good. We're thinking about something that's very precious and meaningful for our lives. But if it's not also directing our life choices, then we're not actively living in the will of God for our lives. We're not actively living in obedience to him. We're just accepting or understanding or hopefully believing this important information about what God has done in our lives. So we must reflect on the abundant mercies of God, but the abundant mercies of God are so abundant, are so uh, effective to bring transformation to our lives, bringing us, transforming us from darkness into light, drawing us near to God. They are so effective for our lives that they can and must affect our life choices as well. And these two um, applications of the abundant mercies of God in our lives are together the things that help us to persevere in hope and not just persevere in hope doing the same things that we might have find ourselves, found ourselves doing from day to day, but also to uh, step beyond those things, seeking the will of God for our lives proclaiming this abundant hope to other people and trusting God to guide us through that no matter where that may take us in our lives. So we've looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 21, and those verses were read through us because it's a longer passage. I won't read them all together again now, but we will look at them uh, verse by verse as we proceed uh, through this study. We often tend to fix our attention more on circumstances than on the abundant mercy of God. And uh, these people that the Apostle Peter is writing to in these places, no doubt, just as we tend to be, had these same tendencies to be distracted by the difficult circumstances, the trials, the persecutions and all of these things. So what can we learn today from these verses about the abundant mercies of God? Let's first challenge our minds. And that's certainly what we see the Apostle Peter doing as he writes to these believers. He first challenges their minds as he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead. As we look at our own lives and our own circumstances, uh, we might be discouraged. We might be 
even hopeless in some senses because we're looking from a from a, a human perspective at our circumstances. But the Apostle Peter immediately in verse 3 raises our gaze away from ourselves, away from our circumstances to God who is worthy to be praised and exalted because of his abundant mercies, because of all that he is and all of his goodness. And he says, as we just read, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, hath uh, regenerated us, hath brought the new life into our lives, into all that believe in Jesus Christ, begotten us again, Unto a living, a lively hope, a living hope, really, new life. And this new life brings us a new hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this is very important, too, because we see the means by which this all takes place. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who gave his life a ransom for many. And this resurrection is a real resurrection from the dead he bodily raised from the dead he is the first fruits of our resurrection that is to come and so as we understand this we see that we do have a living hope because we have a living savior and this is an important component of the abundant mercies of god because the means of god's abundant mercy is living and effective in order to really have hope as we move forward in order to really have our minds transformed we must understand that the hope that we have comes through a living and effective means and that is our lord and savior jesus christ who gave himself a ransom for many and he lives today as mediator and because he lives we too shall live and so it's really important that we allow these theological truths, these realities of what Christ has done, what God has done through Christ to really sink into our thinking. Because sometimes what happens is we, we learn these, these uh, principles of the gospel. We learn the gospel. We understand the gospel. We share the gospel but sometimes then we forget how the gospel is relevant in our lives today as we live the Christian life. And so we need to continue to come back to this and remember the abundant mercies of God to, um, to transform our thinking and to really establish our hope and our confidence in God. And that's really the at the heart of what Peter is writing here, the, the heart of the purpose of what he is writing about is that there is a people who are followers of Jesus Christ. They're dispersed in various places. They are now ostracized in a lot of ways from their, from their societies, but they need to be established in hope. They need to have their focus in the right place so that they are grounded in Christ, and they can thrive where they are in spite of their circumstances. And that's exactly what God wants each one of us to do as well, no matter where we are, to thrive in Christ because of the abundant mercies of God, to have, be strengthened in hope. And so, first of all, we must remember that God's uh, that the means of God's abundant mercy is living and effective. And we see that so directly and clearly in verse 3. But then as we move on, into verse, verses 4 and 5, I'll read them. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And here in these verses, we see another very important aspect that should shape our thinking as we desire to be established in hope. And that um, second very important principle is this. The substance of God's abundant mercy is absolute and eternal. So we looked at the means of his mercy through Christ who was raised from the dead, but also the substance of this abundant mercy. It is absolute. It is eternal. As we see in these verses, it is an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. 
and that does not fade away. And it is reserved for us in heaven. And what about us in our, um, in our uh, connection to this, uh, this hope that does not fade away? How do we uh, stand in regard to this as believers in Christ? Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God? Not by your ability to persevere in strength in your own flesh. Not by your ability, excuse me, to persevere in faith by your own flesh. Not by your ability to somehow always just be doing the right things in order to please God. That's not what this verse says. What does it say? It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The power of God working in us is strengthening our faith. The power of God working in us is keeping us and holding on to us. And so when we look at life circumstances, <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at the trials and the, and the difficulties we face, we know that God is holding on to us. We understand that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in this last time. So truly, the substance of God's abundant mercy is absolute, and it is eternal. And we could also add, it is powerful, keeping us. And <clears throat> so we persevere with confidence and faith because of God's perseverance in strengthening us, in building our faith, in uh, being present in our lives. And so the substance of God's abundant mercy certainly is abundant and eternal. But I see a third thing here as we move down into verses 6 through 10, and we'll, we'll look at those now. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness to the manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith <clears throat> being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, ye be yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of joy, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So here we see also that the application of God's abundant mercy is certain for all who receive it by faith. We greatly rejoice. We, even when we face trials, God is actively at work in our lives and, and he, this application of what God's abundant mercy is doing is something tangible that we can be strengthened by even through trials. So what are so what should our approach be to the trials that we face then? We see first of all that our faith is a response to God's abundant mercy. We, we, we face trials by faith, and our faith is a response to God's abundant mercy. We could, we could rephrase that this way. When we go through difficult circumstances, we take our gaze off of our circumstances, and we put them on God because he is abundantly merciful. He cares for us. He loves us. And we know, because of these other things that we looked at, that he is actively involved in our lives as believers he's actively working in our lives he is actively um, holding on to us and and working to bring about our sanctification his spirit is with us and so we can respond by faith in the abundant mercies of god 
So when we think about this idea of, of living by faith and walking by faith, it is important that our faith be informed. Our faith needs to be informed. That's why it's so important that we are reading God's word, that we're spending time in God's word, because when we're not spending time in God's word and we're not thinking about our position in Christ, when we're not thinking about everything that God has done for us, when we're not thinking about our relationship with the Lord, and instead we're thinking about all of the cares of this life and all of these kinds of things, we tend to respond with weak faith towards the situations that we are in. And so part of what God is doing to build our faith is using the word of God by the spirit of God to remind us of these very important truths. And again, it ties back to God and what he's doing. It is a work of God because it is the word of God. It is a work of God because it's the spirit of God that uses the word of God to convict our hearts. And so we must be informed and be reminded of the reality of our position in Christ. And our faith is strengthened as a result of that. But another thing that I see here is that part of God's work of sanctification in our lives is his work of refining the genuineness of our faith. There's the building of our faith, but there's also the refining of our faith. And both aspects are things that we can see here because clearly... Peter is reminding of everything that God has done through his abundant mercy, the strengthening aspect of our faith, but also the refining aspect of our faith is being described here. And that's not something that Peter is writing about to inform them necessarily. It's something that Peter is describing that they are facing in their lives already. They're facing persecution. They're facing trials. And so what Peter is doing here is reminding them that God is even using these trials in their lives to refine their faith. And that is such an important perspective for us to have as we think of our own lives and our own situations. Instead of thinking that God has forsaken us or God doesn't care about us, we need to take the true perspective that we have from God's word about these situations and realize that God is going to use this to refine our faith. He's going to use it to strengthen us. And when we have that perspective, we are more prepared to do whatever God would have us to do because we know that he's with us, he's for us, that he is um, going to be there for us no matter what we face. And we have to have this kind of perspective in order to live and serve the Lord. Peter is not just writing this um, epistle to the people in these places in order to just encourage their hearts. Ultimately, Peter is challenging them to persevere in the gospel. Peter is challenging them to be faithful witnesses for Christ where they are, not just to be in survival mode, but to be actively advancing the cause of Christ. And so we have to have this permit, this perspective we have to, to approach um, the work that God wants us to do with this understanding, or we're going to think that God calls us to serve him in our own strength and our own abilities. And when we struggle, when trials come, when difficulties come, then that must mean that God has forsaken us. So we better just return back to what we were doing before and find more of a comfort zone. And if we are trusting in our own strength and our own ability and thinking that we are doing something for God instead of God is choosing to do something through us, we can tend to default that way and turn our backs on God when things don't seem to be going the way we would like them to be going. However, if we have this right perspective, we are strengthened in trials. Our faith is refined in trials and, we, and the trials become no longer something despised, but actually something that can be viewed as precious. And that's not a decision that can be made on human reasoning. And it's not something that can be a reality based on human circumstances. Only through the abundant mercy of God in our lives 
can we really come to that conclusion and be honest? Because God, as he refines us, as he molds us, and as he shapes us, he's, he's building our faith, and he's refining our faith, and we are maturing spiritually to the point where we can look back on the way we would have responded at things in the past and say, by God's grace, he's helped me to overcome the um, attitude of resentment that I, that I once had when trials came into my life. And it's that kind of a perspective that enables us to go wherever God calls us to go and do whatever God asks us to do. Because we can understand that even if we go into a hard place, God is not only with us, he is going to use any hardship that we face to actually strengthen us, to actually mature us, yes. and to draw us even closer to him. And our relationship with him will be deeper than it once was yes. if we keep our eyes on him, if we recognize the abundant mercy of God in our lives and don't lose sight of that. And that is really important. So let's think a little bit about the trials a little here and the, and the difficulties that we face. You know, as human beings, we understand that hardships can make us stronger people. But let's understand that these verses are something different than that. The world knows that we need to exercise and, and work hard in order to have a, a build-up physique and in order to be stronger. That's why the military has training, basic training, before soldiers are sent off into any kind of conflict, because those kinds of hardships make a stronger person. But this isn't what Peter's talking about here. This is something different. Let's understand that. This, the point is not human strength or human resilience. The trial... Resilient human resilience in trials is not the message of these verses. It's looking back on God and what he is going to do through these trials and the understanding that he has not forsaken us and the understanding that uh, though he slay me, yet I can trust him because of his promises that the things of this life, this life itself is not the end for us. And we can come to the point where we can agree with the Apostle Paul who says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when we understand the abundant mercies of God, we really begin to see the gain aspect of what is being referred to there. Abundant life, eternal life, life with Christ in his presence, freed from uh, sin and all of the effects of sin in this world. No longer to be, uh, to be uh, in fear or sorrow, but rather eternal joy in the presence of the Lord. So even there is abundant hope because of the abundant mercy of God. And so the trial of our faith is not building us physically to make us stronger people in order to withstand trials. The trial of our faith is turning our attention away from ourselves to Christ, to the abundant mercy of God, so that we are prepared to be confident in hope, hoping through trial. And that's something that only God can do in our lives, because as in, as as human beings, as, as people and individuals, in our own strength, we don't have a lot that we really can hope in. As we get older, we begin to see more and more of our weaknesses and our failures and our inabilities. But those that hope in God will not be ashamed. You know, often we think that the most merciful thing that God could do for us is to immediately deliver us from our trials. So let's think about that for a little bit. We're talking about the, the abundant mercies of God. But Peter is not making that point when he writes these letters, when he writes this letter to the, these churches in Galatia. He emphasizes a different aspect of God's mercy. You know, Elizabeth Elliot 
made a very important point, I think, about this topic that we just met, that I just mentioned. She said this, God never withholds from his child that which his love and wisdom call good. God's refusals are always merciful, severe mercies at times, but mercies all the same. God never, desires, God never denies us our heart's desire, except to give us something better. And as we put this in the context of trials, humanly speaking, we want to be removed from the trial. And we, again, we see that as God's mercy, getting us out of the circumstance. But Elizabeth Elliot makes a really valuable point here when she speaks of God's severe mercies. From our perspective, severe. From God's perspective, perfect. But because we are humans and we, we analyze the things that we face from a human perspective, this term severe mercies is actually very meaningful for us. Because it's something that only would make sense in the context of abundantly merciful God, who is working for our good in all situations. And when we understand that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold, which perishes, because it's refining our faith, it's refining our relationship with the Lord. It's causing us to cast our cares more upon him. Then we can understand that God is, in fact, acting mercifully in our lives. He is, in fact, being good, as we <laughs> declare um, in, our, in our songs and in, in our confessions that God is good. He is, in fact, being good even in our trials though severe it may seem, because he wants to refine our faith, because he wants to build our hope and our confidence in him. He wants to turn our eyes away from the circumstances and onto him. And when we allow him to do that, we do become strengthened in faith. We do depend on him more. So this is really about our perspective, our thinking. And first of all, our thinking needs to be transformed. Let the abundant mercy of God dominate your thinking. But also, as we said at the beginning, we need to let the abundant mercy of God dominate our life choices. And quickly, I want to get into this. And it really starts in verse 13, where in verse 13, we see the first command of this chapter. What does Peter say? He says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This call to persevere in hope, to gird up the loins of your mind, to think properly about the circumstance. And that's really what is at the heart of what he's saying there. Girding up the loins of our mind, it speaks back to uh, something of the day and culture in which Peter is writing where uh, the men would often wear a form of robe. And in order to, uh, to, to do physical active work or in order to run quickly to accomplish something, they needed to, to gird up or tie up the loose ends of their garment, and so, so it wouldn't be getting in the way as they run. And so in this, this word picture here, we understand that we need to tie up or gird up the loose ends of our thinking. You know, our thinking can be really going off in a lot of different directions, but Peter is challenging us to turn our thinking to the abundant mercy of God because God wants to work abundantly in our lives. And so we need to, we are first challenged and called to uh, take control of our thinking and cast our gaze on the Lord. This is the first command of this text. Persevere in hope. Fix your eyes on the Lord. We persevere in hope by thinking Excuse me, we persevere in hope by keeping every area of our thinking informed 
about the abundant mercy of God. In order to illustrate this, I'd like to turn your attention to a passage in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 16 through 23. I'll read it quickly. Lamentations written by the apostle, excuse me, by the prophet uh, Jeremiah at the time that Jerusalem had been destroyed. The nation of Israel was being taken into captivity. All of the, the beauty of Jerusalem and Judea had come to ruin. There was poverty. There was famine. There was absolute destruction. And Jeremiah speaks to this, but he doesn't keep his focus there. Let's see what he says, starting in verse 16 of chapter 3. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes, and thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity, and I said my strength and my hope is perished from, is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and, he, and is humbled in me. This I recall in my mind, therefore, therefore I have hope. In spite of all this, in spite of these, what we could call severe mercies. In Jeremiah's case, yes, severe mercies. He's, he's living through the result of, his, of, of Judah's sin. And though he's taking a stand for the word of God and truth, he's living in this. And God is doing something in Jeremiah's life too. And so what does Jeremiah say? What is his personal response to all of this after recounting the misery that he's in? This I recall to mind and therefore I have hope. It is the mercies, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And this is exactly the hope that the Apostle Peter is referring to when he writes to these dispersed peoples in Galatia, these followers of Jesus Christ. The Lord is faithful. We can quietly wait on the Lord for his salvation, for his deliverance. And that is the ultimate perspective of our hope. We hope in the promises of God, and ultimately we hope in the salvation of God. And that gives us confidence. We persevere in hope by protecting our thinking from being controlled or dominated by other things. So first of all, Peter emphasizes these things and describes how this hope that we have, the understanding of the abundant mercies of God, allows us to faith, tr face trials and tribulations with confidence and with joy and with a right perspective. But now we come to this first command. So gird up the loins of your mind. Focus on what is true. Focus on what is a reality, the reality in Christ. And he will strengthen you through this. Quickly moving on, there's also a call to be holy in verses 14 through 16. Understand it again in this context. As obedient children... Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God is holy. God always has been holy. He is the same God that shook the mountain in Sinai. He is the same God that brought wrath upon the nation of Israel and other nations in their, obedience, in their disobedience, calling them to be holy. He is the same God who chose to dwell in the holiest place of the tabernacle. 
he hasn't changed at this point that Peter is writing this letter, nor does he ever change. But notice the terminology around this command. Who is God? What is God described as in these passages? As a father. We respond to the holiness of God as children who have been adopted as as people transformed and brought near unto God, we respond as children to a heavenly father and desire to be as he is because of who he is, because of his abundant mercy in our lives. And that is a very important perspective for us to have as we look at this command. Because if we take this command outside of the context of these verses, we see certainly a good command, certainly a necessary command, but from a human perspective, also an impossible command. Because man, in man's own ability, cannot be holy as God is holy. And we understand that. But we need to be careful that we approach this in light of the abundant mercy of God and who we are in Christ and the power of God working in us to do what we cannot do in and of ourselves. That is why God has given us his spirit. That is why through Christ, uh, we, are, um, Im- we are imputed with the righteousness of God. And our sinfulness is imputed to Christ who bore our guilt on the cross. So we see positionally where this call to be holiness comes from, to be holy comes from. But we also understand that in practice, we are truly called to live holy before God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, as our faith is strengthened by casting our cares upon God and not on our circumstances, we see God working in us and strengthening us and changing us. And we so what do we what are we looking at here? We're looking at a relationship, this relationship with God as his children, in his care, hoping in him, confident in him hoping in the redemption that he has purchased for us and the salvation that he promises to us. And this perspective helps us to grow in our love for him. And as we love him as his children, we desire to be holy as he is holy. Because we know whom we belong to. And now very quickly, let me just hit the last thing here. There is a third and very important uh, command that is given here, and that is we need to have a proper fear of God to motivate our conduct. Verses 17 through 21, quickly. And if you call upon the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversations or your vain lifestyles received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God." And so as we look quickly at this last concept of having a proper fear attitude towards God, we understand that as children of God through Christ, we we love God and he loves us. But at the same time, we reverence God and we um, take seriously the will of God for our lives. And this speaks to this aspect of fear before him. A a proper fear of God is not in opposition to a proper understanding of the abundant mercies of God. Let's just understand that and, and, and realize that. It is not a fear of condemnation for the child of God. Rather, 
It is respect for or reverence towards God's perfect justice. How does the passage uh, uh, explain this situation here? God is not a respecter of persons. God is a perfect judge. God does look at our lives. God does stand as judge over all mankind, over all all things. And yet positionally in Christ, we have confidence in his judgment. Because we are not condemned based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But yet God also stands as um, judge over our lives in the sense of uh, being the one who gives the reward for the race that we have run. Being the one who gives the reward for uh, the fruit that we have borne through faith in Christ and through um, the Holy Spirit being at work in our lives. And so this is a fear, as we would understand the fear of a father-child relationship that a child would have towards their mother or their father. Not a fear of... Um, in this perfect relationship, now we might have situations in our own broken human uh, realities that don't reflect this, but in a perfect situation as God designed the home, it is a fear of respect and it is a fear of desiring to live in obedience. And this is something that is given to us as, as a command, as children, as followers of Jesus Christ and as children of God, to have a proper fear of God that motivates our conduct. And so as I close, I just want to say this. In light of all of this, maybe you're facing difficult circumstances right now and you needed to be reminded of the abundant mercies of God, that God wants to use this in your life to refine your faith and to build your faith and it is an opportunity for us to no longer look at our trials and circumstances as the absence of God's mercy, but rather as the abundance of God's mercy. And these trials can even be viewed as something more precious than gold because the results of them through Christ working in us will not perish. But also as we look at this relational aspect of our walk with the Lord, let's take this seriously. Let's gird up the loins of our minds. Let us... Uh, Fix our minds on what is true. Let us be holy as he is holy. And let us live before him in fear and reverence as his children who hope in him. And ultimately, with this perspective, no matter what God calls us to do, no matter what, where he leads us, we can be confident and we can be joyful and we can live by faith. Maybe there's someone here today that feels the Lord leading them in a certain direction, but there are a lot of difficulties and trials and, and fears that are holding you back. Can I challenge you to turn your attention back to the abundant mercies of God and the hope and the joy that we have as his children? We can trust him. We can follow him whether he be calling to the mission field, whether he be calling to some form of other ministry, or maybe it's just something with relation to our finally coming to terms with the goodness of God so that we can deal properly with the circumstances that we're facing within our lives right now. Let's hope in the Lord.